Some have called um, an act of literary vandalism. I like, I like that. So uh, this is an article called An Act of Literary Vandalism, um, where uh, the publisher, not, not because of anybody demanding it, not because of the government forcing them, not because of any act, the publisher who owns the copyright of the books and according to current law has every right to edit them, change them, has taken the books of Robert Dahl. You might know, I know Robert Dahl primarily from Matilda. I think Matilda is the, is, is the main book of Robert Dahl's that I have read. I, I, he's a little bit too absurdist and a little bit too vulgar for, uh, for my, uh, vulgar and ugly for my taste in children's literature. These are not books I particularly uh, encourage my kids to read. I, I, you know, they're, they're kind of fun and interesting, but they're also ugly. I, they emphasize ugliness. Uh, so I... I guess to some extent, I canceled Robert Dahl a long time ago because I don't really uh, roll on rolled rolled Dahl a while ago because I don't really I didn't really enjoy it except Matilda. I thought Matilda was really really funny and, and quirky and interesting. Um, but uh, what Dahl is known for are uh, characters who are quirky and different. Uh, he describes them often as fat and ugly and and. Uh, uh, and all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, colorful descriptions. The action is often depressing. Uh, his books don't necessarily have happy endings, um, and and ugly things and grotesque stuff happens to people uh, in his story. You don't like that? Don't read Robert Dahl. I will dull. Just dull. I'm just calling it dull because everything else is is uh, is clearly uh, too difficult. Um, anyway, um, what the publisher decided to do is uh, the publisher has decided uh, to soften him uh, and to make him uh, more, quote, appropriate for uh, the 21st century and for woke culture. So, for example, uh, in uh, uh, Augustus Gloop, one of the characters in his books, is no longer fat because to call somebody fat is just inconsiderate and not nice, and why point that out? And, uh, and it's just not politically correct. It's not woke. Uh, Mr. Twit is no longer fearfully ugly. Fearfully ugly, not just ugly, fearfully ugly, because again, that's just not right. The Oompa Loompas have gone gender neutral in the new editions of the books. Uh, this is the publisher Puffin, and uh, they have basically taken all the books and they've assigned, um, uh, you know, special woke uh, sensitivity readers. Literally, they call them sensitivity readers. And these sensitivities readers have gone through the books and have marked all the passages that they have found potentially offensive to some potential child, adult, I don't know. Um, uh, these, uh, these sensitivity readers... Um, Sometimes they're called inclusive minds. I don't know what the hell that means. Uh, which is a collective, a collective of peop for people who are passionate about inclusion and accessibility in children's literature. So these are people who specialize in destroying children's literature for the sake of woke culture. Now, so the company, uh, the company is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, reissued all of Dahl's books with these new writings. Let me, let, me read you, let me read you a few examples of what they've done. So uh, in the original, the 2001 edition, this is The Witches, um, Robert Dahl, uh, not Robert, Dahl wrote, don't be foolish, my grandmother said. You can't go around pulling the hair of every lady you meet, even if she is wearing gloves. Just you try it and see what happens. The new one says, don't be foolish, my grandmother said. Besides, there are plenty of other reasons why women might wear wigs, and there is certainly nothing wrong with it. So the idea is, uh, in the book, I think, witches wear gloves and, 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 uh, and wigs. Um, and, uh, you know, so now it doesn't want to suggest that every woman out there has a wig, so they make it explicit. Dahl would never write a sentence like, there are plenty of other reasons why women might wear wigs, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. That is not a dull sentence. That is completely out of character of his books. Um, another example from The Witches. 
even if she is working as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman. God, that's awful. That is a stereotype of a woman. You can't have that. So the new edition says, even if she is working as a top scientist or running a business. Uh, another one from Matilda. She went on olden day sailing ships with jo Joseph Conrad. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rupert Kipling. You know, so these are all authors, uh, Joseph Conrad, Ernest Hemingway, Rupert Kipling. Now, of course, Joseph Conrad and uh, 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 Rupert Kipling are not PC anymore. They're not okay. You can't refer to them. They're both authors from the imperial past of uh, uh, Britain. Uh, they both have, can be interpreted as being racist. Not acceptable anymore. So the new version is, now of course this is Matilda reading books and going on trips because, you know, the adventures through novels. I mean, that's a beautiful sentiment, right? In the new novel it says, she went to the 19th century estates with Jane Austen. That sounds so boring. She went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway is still okay. You can all read Ernest Hemingway and still be okay. Don't worry. And California which, with, uh, you know, with uh, John Steinbeck instead of to India with Rupert Kipling. <laughs> uh, so again, all the references to, to physical appearance have been edited. The word fat has been removed. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory... Um, you know, uh, uh, now he's only described as enormous, not as a ball of dough. Um, ball of dough is out, right? Uh, in the same story, the Oompa Loompas are not tiny, t uh, titchy, or no higher than my knee, but merely small. I mean, how dull of a language. I mean, it, it, doll is known for this kind of tiny, titchy, no higher than my knee, you know, small. How dull is that beyond anything else? They were once small men. Now the Oompa Loompas are small people. Because we can't gender define them. I mean, who knows? Maybe they've chosen not to be men since then. Um, boys and girls now have been turned into children. No boys and girls. And the cloud men in uh, James and the Peach have become cloud people. And fantastic Mr. Fox's three sons have become three daughters. And then you've got whole sections that were never written, that they've added. They've added. Um, so uh, this, is, um, this is kind of a, a corporation, a publisher. Uh, not under any pressure, as far as we know. Nobody wrote to them and said, I mean, maybe some people wrote to them, but not any, any heavy pressure to, to do anything. Uh, decided of its own own decision, supposedly to maximize, maximize um, audience, to completely neut neuter, as they call it, what do they call it? Uh, uh, you know, literary vandalism, to commit literary vandalism against Dahl um, by rewriting uh, these books. It's just, it's just stupid and horrible and offensive and ridiculous, and you could go on and on and on. But there is real evidence, I think, and, and, and I've got, you know, you can actually see some graphs and numbers. And it's not definitive, and it's still, you know, a questionable because the seem, and I've said this on other shows, it really does seem that this wokeness thing has peaked. I mean, indeed, this doll, you know, rewriting of Doll's book has irked not only conservatives. Indeed, conservatives are some of the quieter vo voices with regard to Dahl. And it's not just kind of the, the Barry Weiss center left. You're seeing even some of the people who consider themselves woke. You're part of the uh, academic movement that led us to the, the place of woke that exists today. Even they are criticizing this. I think this is one of the first examples where we're seeing even people on the, on the left that in the past have just gone with anything, saying, wait a minute, maybe, maybe this is too far, maybe this is too much, maybe we've crossed. We might have approached peak woke. Now, peak woke is measured by certain things, 
I think, I think uh, two things are going on here. One, we've probably reached peak of absurdity. We've probably reached peak of just number of offenses and number of incidents and, and the number of publications and the number of books. The flip side of that is that some of the most damaging things that woke have brought into our life, into our management, into the way we run our businesses, much of that has been normalized. I don't think DEI standards at businesses for hiring are going away, although, as I'll tell you in a minute, DI departments in many tech companies are shrinking significantly. I think, you know, I've, I've talked about these uh, DEI statements that uh, faculty, new faculty at University of California have to make if they're going to get a job. I don't think that's going away anytime soon, but I have a feeling that a lot of departments are going to weight them less, less, right? Um, than others. And um, it seems that, it seems like a, there's, there's, there's kind of a new permanent level of, of these institutions and this attitude that now is going to be in society. But that the real nattiness is probably peaked and over with. I, I think maybe a, a good representation of that is the resignation of, of, the, uh, of the prime minister or the first minister, I don't know how they call it, I think they call it the first minister of Scotland. The fact that even in Scotland, as left-wing as it is, as social as it is, as crazy as it is, their whole attitude towards the, the whole issue of trans was so absurd and so ridiculous and so over the top that they're, they're basically their first minister had to resign over it uh, just a few days ago. But I actually have a, I have to leave, there is an article out there uh, by a guy named Musa El Gabi, uh, who is an academic and he has just documented the, uh, the fact that by many measures, by, by em, almost every measure that is quantifiable, um, the whole woke issue peaked last year, uh, two years ago, in 2021. Now let's start just with a little bit of background on the whole social justice woke issue. It, it, this really came about, really started to see a shift towards heightened uh, identity politics, primarily focused on sexual, race, gender, heightened uh, sense of social justice, primarily in areas like tech, finance, education, journalism, art, entertainment, design, consulting, and primarily led and, and driven through the universities. We started to see that in about 2011. We started to see the shift. I think the first real movement of uh, the 2011 um, and then uh, it continued with the uh, kind of with the post-Trump resistant movement uh, and it culminated, I think, with BLM in 2020 and everything happened after BLM. So first, the first thing you can see is post-2011, you see dramatically heightened protest movement, uh, active protest, an entire, if you will, professional class and others that now are dedicated to um, you know, to the idea of, um, of, 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 of protesting all the so-called social injustices that are going on. And really, protests, um, protests in the name of social justice, in the name of DEI, in the name of wokeness, really peaked with BLM. They've never achieved a BLM level post-BLM. Now, there hasn't been an event to stimulate it, but, but that was really the peak. It also was the peak of, I would say, the peak of acceptance in American culture of, um, of the whole woke agenda. I think when BLM started, people saw the, the pictures of George Floyd uh, murder. People were very upset. And people who weren't typically far left and were typically uh, uh, pro the whole, even Occupy Wall Street or, or even 
uh, any of the kind of other big time leftist agenda, uh, people really responded to George Floyd and responded to reflection and a lot of honest support for whatever positive element there was within BLM. I think a lot of people were convinced there was systemic racism and there was the potential of, of racism in police departments. And right or wrong, I think many of them were honest and they demonstrated. But then as the demonstration turns into, turned into riots and the riots continued and continued and continued, and as data came out about maybe America is not as racist as some people think it is, a lot of people turned away from BLM. And I think really, I think the beginning of the end of the beginning of the descent of uh, the whole movement starts with uh, the BLM protest. It was the peak, and since then it's been in decline. And a big part of the decline is people being disenchanted with it. Um, and uh, people walked away, I think, and walked away from the whole woke movement. But it took time. It took the absurdities of wokeness to really come to the forefront. Uh, during the same period of time, 2011 to 2022, there was a significant unrest within the economy, within institutions, in finance, in journalism, in, in, in tech, in social media. There were significant campaigns to get people fired. Every year you heard stories about people getting fired because of opinions they expressed that were not, quote, politically correct based on the late, latest woke thing. And when institutions were called upon, hey, why did you do this? Why did you, they would issue apologies. They would, on, on contentious political issues, uh, you know, uh, organizations and institutions and corporations took strong stands, which they hadn't historically. Corporations donated enormous amounts of money to activist organizations, and all of them, almost all of them, expanded their DEI initiatives. And in terms of output, in terms of what was printed on uh, uh, printed in newspaper, on television, what was said in books and academic scholarship, issues of, uh, of uh, discrimination based on race, gender, trans issues, all of these issues, you see from 2011 upticks in publication and talking about it and the repeated certain woke terms all accelerated through that. And, and you see this even before uh, Donald Trump was elected and then accelerated once Donald, Tr Donald Trump uh, was elected. Uh, the entertainment business became more and more woke and you saw more and more uh, movies, uh, movies and TV series that... Uh, that Pandered to the woke crowd, you saw more and more um, cancellation campaigns against actors, producers, writers who didn't fit into the mold uh, exactly. So there was this massive trend from 2011 really to 2021 uh, where all of this happened. And, and, and people, if you look at, 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 at uh, uh, you know, liberals, liberals or, or left people who identify as liberals or democratic they moved far left uh, on, on these issues. And this became a, a, a real big issue. Indeed, it was so bad that to some extent, it, it became, uh, these woke issues became dominantly issues of uh, white leftists. And to a large extent, they alienated uh, non-whites, they alienated less educated, they alienated less affluent, because the real woke people were rich, were well-educated, and they tended to be white. But after 10 years of this acceleration, and again, a lot of these statistics are coming out of this article called The Great, uh, the Great Awakening is Winding Down by Musa al-Gawbi. You can find him. He's got a substack, like everybody. Uh, and he makes the argument that this is peaked now, uh, that this unrest is gone. If you look at the number of scholars under fire, uh, the number of scholars that are being attacked, the number of scholars that are being threatened, so if you look at incidents where students are targeting scholars or petitions against professors or sanctions against professors or, most dramatic, where professors have been terminated, all of those peaked in 2020 or 2021. 2022 is a down year from, by every single one of those measures. 
Indeed, I think a good example of this is the uproar in Hamlin College about the showing of the Muslim, uh, of, of the painting of Muhammad. Yes, Hamlin College landed up firing the professor, but you know what? Almost everybody, left, right, and center, objected. Uh, the art department, the art department, about as left as you can get probably, at the University of Minnesota, objected. Other universities objected. The teacher who was fired was hired by another university in Minnesota with Muslim students in that university, and yet you, they were hired. So there's a real shift. I think if that incident happened two years earlier, they would have fired the professor, everybody would have supported them, and they would have been quiet. But the fact is, in this case, even the New York Times came out against it, multiple publications came out about, against it. Again, that unanimity of wokeness, that unanimity of ideas from the left, to a large extent, that has disappeared. That has gone away. If you look at data that looks at, um, at cancel culture incidents from 2010 to 2022, um, by all measures, it peaked in 2020. Again, some peaked in 2021, but by 2022, they were all down. Indeed, they're down to 2019 levels in some cases, even some cases even below 19 le uh, 2019 levels. They're certainly not back to 2010. Let's not, and they're never going back. There's some new normal that is going to be established, but they're definitely done. If you look at scholarships, publications focused on bias and discrimination from 20, 2000 to 2022, being going up and up and up and up and up, and then they peak in 2020 and they've been coming down slowly. Slowly, they're still high, still way too many publications that publish about bias, but they're nowhere near as sexy of a topic, as, 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 as viewed as a crucial as a topic as they were, as they were before. Uh, even in the media, if you look at, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, at just media, news media, uh, publications, and, uh, and uh, TV, and stuff like that, uh, well, I think this is just, uh, you know, this is print media. If you look at the frequency of the use of the term racist, racists, racism, right? Again, it was pretty flat until about 2020, uh, sorry, 2010. Almost no, I mean, there was always discussion about racist, racist, racism. But it, it, 2010, it just goes like that. It just goes through the roof. Peaks at 2020, collapses in 2021, goes down again in 2022. And, uh, you know, in places like the Wall Street Journal, it's almost back to 2010 levels. Places like the New York Times, it's back to like 2015, 2016 levels in uh, the Washington Post. It's back to 2015, maybe 2016, 17 levels. Every single one of the major publications, it's down significantly. So I've told you I thought wokeness had peaked, but this guy is giving us data, which is cool. If you look at search terms on uh, cable news, cable news discourse about diversity, equity, harm, racism, sexism, white privilege, all of them down, peaked in 2021, down in 2022. Now, again, this could all reverse. This could be a false alarm. Other aspects of this, uh, here's a story uh, which I found interesting. Uh, the New York Times was recently, and I'm reading from the article, the New York Times was recently targeted by GLAAD. This is one of the, I guess, pro-trans groups. In an open letter signed by dozens of celebrities and thought leaders, primarily for publishing stories about transgender issues that included perspectives of people who did not simply celebrate and affirm progressive activists' preferred narrative. So they were attacked. The New York Times is attacked by all these celebrities and even writers at the New York Times that they're not pro-trans enough, that they're trying to be objective and presenting non-pro-trans views at the same time. So here's what happened. Like in the past, the New York Times would have said, sorry, we'll fix it, fired a few reporters that wrote those stories and hired new people. But this time, 
instead of an apology and instead of saying they'll do better or firing people, benching people, reassigning people, instead of all that, they wrote the following. Quote, we received the open letter delivered by GLAD and welcomed their feedback. We understand how GLAD and the other co-signers of the letter see our coverage. But at the same time, we recognize that GLAD's advocacy mission and the Times journalistic mission are different. Wow. Our journalism strives to explore, interrogate, and reflect the experiences, ideas, and debates in society to help readers understand them. Our reporting did just that, and we're proud of it. That's pretty cool. That's a good response. Now, you could question whether the New York Times lives up to its own standards, and you should. But the fact that they stood up to GLAD, the fact that they reaffirmed their commitment to such reporting and that they would not be just a mouthpiece for leftist advocates is pretty impressive. Now, it even gets even better, I think, because contemporary demanding greater conformance with progressive activists, uh, the narrative of progressive activists on transgender issues. And this was the New York Times response, quote, it is not unusual for outside groups to critique our coverage or to rally supporters to influence our journalism. In this case, however, members of staff and contributors to the Times joined the effort. Their protest letter included direct attacks on several colleagues, singling them out policy. We do not welcome and will not tolerate participation by Times journalists in protests organized by advocacy groups or attacks on colleagues in our social media and other public forums. Wow. Two years ago, you would have not seen that from the New York Times. Two years ago, I could have told you stories of the exact opposite happening in the New York Times. Times, they are changing. It's just, I mean, it's mind-boggling that the New York Times wrote that. Uh, and you're seeing it across the board. Um, and, and if you look at opinions of Americans, Liberals, leftists, they have moderated as well. They've moved away from the more radical position. So here's a question that, that here's a statement that uh, uh, people were asked whether they view it positively or ne negatively. They, do they disagree with it, basically? Do they disagree with it? Here's this, and work their way up. Blacks should do the same without any special favor. So in the past, among white liberals, 40% disagreed in 2012. That went up to almost... Uh, disagreement with this is down uh, among uh, blacks, among Hispanics, even among white conservatives, but their numbers were never very high to begin with. But in every measure, the idea that blacks should, should, uh, should do the same without any special favors is more popular now than it was two years ago. Again, small movements, slightly from 80 to 60% is not slightly. God. Um, again, these could reverse themselves. It's a small um, uh, popularity of, um, of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of these leftist ideas has become, is, is, is declining, is declining. Um, the vibes have shifted. It's definitely shifted. Let's see. Um, and we're seeing it in corporate America as well. I think I told you last time that when you look at the big tech layoffs that have happened over the last few months, many of them now, um, Companies are, are changing their attitudes towards DEI and towards woke. Take Netflix, woke as possible. But then, uh, when workers at Netflix attempted to cancel Dave Chappelle in late 2021, the company didn't support them. They didn't apologize. They didn't cancel Dave, Dave Chappelle. And, and the contrary. Executives issued a memo informing protesting employees that if they weren't open to publishing content they disagree with, they should quit. When they did layoffs, a lot of the employees that complained about the Dave Chappelle thing were fired. At Disney, had PR controversies around uh, Disney and Florida, 
but they had, they made all these movies that were super woke and super everything that did very, very badly in the box office. Um, guess what happened last year? They fired their CEO. Bob uh, Chapek was fired. Ex-CEO Bob Iger came in, immediately was more conciliatory towards the whole culture wars. Uh, you know, acknowledged that Disney and its employees uh, have maybe different values that much of America promised to try to accommodate the values of, of a wider spectrum of Americans. Uh, Disney had seemed to supposedly making efforts to have a broader reach and, 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 and appeal to a broader segment of the audience. I mean, across the board, employers seem to feel less social pressure to conspicuously conform with demands, again, I'm reading from this article, uh, made in the name of social justice. Instead, executive seems to, f uh, to feel increasing social permission to marginalize, censor, or purge employee activists in order to shore up their own authority and enhance the bottom line. Now again, and has now become entrenched in corporate America, some version of it, but I think the excess of wokeness, the worst of wokeness, the, 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 the craziness, I think that's peaked, and I think that's in decline, and I think we're getting some semblance of normalcy and, and reasonableness, reasonableness, yes. Um, and, uh, and I, for one, am encouraged and, and, and think that uh, times are better, right? Times are better. Now, I, I think a lot of people out there don't like that message. I think there is an entire industry based on and an entire emotional connection based on the idea that the world is falling apart, that the world is horrible and terrible, that all the trends are going against us and we need to fight everybody and everything because, uh, you know, the world is, is horrible and wokeness is all over the place. I think a message that says things might be getting better is not a popular message. I don't think I'm going to add any subscribers as a consequence of this. I don't think, I think quite the contrary. I think uh, in the end of America, the end of, uh, the, end of the world is a much more uh, appealing, it seems, uh, uh, to people. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.